If the Earth is a circle, how does the water always stay? Gravity. But there's a, the water is a little bit more heavier than gravity. My physique of a Greek god. <laughs> He's not even Greek. Okay, so we're known for celebrity tape, okay. And, um, well, who is the celebrity? I am. Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Sid. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Sid underscore Dwyer. And in today's video, I'm going to be talking about Farrah Abraham. If you saw my video on Shane Dawson's old podcast, you will know that Farrah Abraham was a big part of his podcast. And going over that situation for that video unlocked a lot of memories for me. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot because Farrah really made her mark on the adult industry, the internet, and on reality TV back in the day. I'd say probably from the span of 2010 to 2016. She's still doing controversial things and wreaking havoc on the world to this day. What time is your manager here? But I'd say that span of time was when it was her heyday. So yeah, I'm just going to go over most of that in this video. So Farrah was born in Omaha, Nebraska to mother Deborah and father Michael. She also has an older half-sister named Ashley. And from a very early age, Farrah had a pretty tumultuous childhood. Her parents wouldn't let her hang out with certain people. And I grew up with a little bit of um, just hate, a hateful aura in my family and a little bit racist. I, I couldn't be friends with certain people. And it was those kinds of controlling ways that drove a wedge between Farah and her parents. Her and her sister were always fighting with their parents and their grandparents to the point where it would sometimes end in a physical altercation. And according to Farah, she would always feel bad for her sister because she always got it the worst. Outside of the house as a teenager, Farah kept herself pretty busy. She did cheerleading, she worked an office job, and she also had a boyfriend named Derek that she met at the age of 15. And much like her relationship with her parents, she had a pretty toxic relationship with Derek. They would often break up with each other and then get with other people to make each other jealous. And Derek was another point of contention between Farah and her parents. They just really did not like him. Farah's dad actually threatened Derek with a knife at one point, causing Farrah's dad to be arrested and charged. And then their worst nightmare came true and Farrah got pregnant with Derek's baby. She was initially pretty scared to tell her parents about her pregnancy because her mom, Deborah, had once threatened that she would be kicked out of the house if she got pregnant. But when she told her parents, they had a change of heart and they didn't kick her out. But they had two conditions they wanted her to agree to. The first one was to not abort the baby and the second one was to keep the baby a secret from Derek. And so she did. Because of her pregnancy, she had to give up cheerleading and then later her office job. And it was actually her cheerleading coach who told her that MTV were doing a TV show called 16 and Pregnant. And so she applied for it and made it onto the cast. It wasn't until the MTV camera crew started following her around the schoolyard that suspicions started to grow that she was 16 and pregnant. Then when she was eight months pregnant, Derek unfortunately died in a car crash when his car hit black ice on a highway. And because of his death, those charges against Farrah's father were dropped, and he died never knowing that Farrah was pregnant with his child. And just let me circle back to 16 and Pregnant real quick. So 16 and Pregnant was a TV show that basically took a bunch of teenagers and documented the process of them being pregnant as a teenager and giving birth. And as for Farah, that process involved a lot of drama. She was having troubles within her friend group because the whole school was finding out that she was pregnant when she had only told two people in her friend group. There's a scene where Farah sits down with a larger group of her friends to tell them that she is pregnant and they all say that they already know and that it was Farah's supposed best friend that already told them. And then of course, as well as having the issues at school, she was also having issues at home. Tension was growing between Farah and her mother because Farah didn't have a car at the time and was always needing to rely on her parents to get a lift to organize things for the baby. And then when it got to a point where Farah was ready to buy a car, she was set on a certain model, but her mum Deborah didn't approve. And then this caused a very heated argument and it escalated to the point where Deborah reached across the car to hit Farah. And then Deborah dropped Farah off in a parking lot and Farah's grandfather picked her up. 
and it was likely this sort of dysfunction that caused Farrah to be selected as one of four teen mums to appear in a spin-off series called Teen Mum. Macy, Caitlin, and Amber were the other three teen mums chosen to be a part of this series. But out of all of the teen mums, Farrah definitely had the most drama and conflict in every season. So in season one, Farrah attempts to date people as a teen mum, but her mum doesn't approve. Because of this, amongst other things, this causes Farrah to seriously contemplate moving out of her parents' house. But by the end of the season, her and her mum seem to be in somewhat of a good place. That is, until season two came around, because that was a really big season for Farrah. She gets into a very intense fight with her mother, to the point where she calls the police on her. My mom, I need a to officer or something because... Okay, what's the address? Okay, what's going on there? Um, my mom apparently has gave me my face and so it's in my daughter's face. Did anybody in ambulance? No. And then Deborah gets arrested, creating one of the biggest moments in teen mom history. And then that situation sets in motion a series of events of Farrah trying to move out of her parents' house again, which she ultimately does achieve. And then she falls victim to a scam, commonly known as the Nigerian Prince Scam or Advance Fee Scam. Essentially, Farrah lists her car online for sale, and then someone offers her $8,000. 3000 of which is supposed to be for shipping costs, which the buyer is going to organize. And the way that they're going to get Farah this $8,000 is by sending them a check in the mail. So as soon as she receives the check, but before she attempts to cash it, Farah wires $3,000 of that into their bank account so that they're able to organize the shipping. She of course doesn't want to make it look like she's going to scam them or take off with their $8,000. So she's, you know, in a hurry trying to get this three grand to them. And that is the way that this scam works. It kind of disarms you with trust and confidence. And Farah is too busy thinking about how this person trusts her with a large sum of their money to stop and think about the fact that if they're the one taking care of the shipping costs, why wouldn't they just send Farah a check for $5,000 and they keep their $3,000 to organize the shipping? Like, why would they need to send her their money so that she can send it back to them? That's suspicious. That's weird. It doesn't really make sense, but a lot of people do get scammed this way, so it happens. Sorry if this is getting a little off track now, but if you're wondering why the MTV camera crew and producers didn't step in and stop Farrah from getting scammed, here's why. An MTV representative made a statement saying, Teen Mom is an unvarnished look at the challenges teenage parents face. The docuseries captures their real lives, the choices they make, and the consequences of those choices. By telling these stories, the series is raising consciousness about issues and situations young people face, and hopefully educating our audience. So basically, they're saying that they had to let Farrah get scammed so that people can learn from her mistakes. But ultimately, this situation forces Farrah to realize that she needs her parents. So she decides to go to counseling with her mother and considers moving back in with her. And while all that's going on, she decides to reconnect with Derek's side of the family in the hopes of one of them volunteering to do a paternity test so that she can qualify for government assistance as a widow. And then that takes us to season three. I think I just realized that I haven't even mentioned Farrah's daughter, Sophia, once. That just goes to show that like teen mom, hardly about the teen moms, all about the drama. So anyways, Derek's sister agrees to do a paternity test and it is confirmed that Derek is in fact Sophia's father. But despite now qualifying for assistance, more issues now arose because Derek's side of the family wanted to be a part of Sophia's life. So Sophia's paternal grandmother sued Farah for visitation rights. And then they go to court over this and Farrah wins. And other than that, in season three, Farrah tosses up between moving to California or Florida. And this causes more issues between her and her parents because they urge her to leave Sophia behind with her, which is something that she agrees to do. So then she decides that it's Florida where she's going to move to. And then in season four is when she makes the move. And she changes her mind about leaving Sophia behind with her parents and takes Sophia with her. Pretty much what happens when she moves to Florida is that she goes on a bunch of 
dates and then eventually lands a boyfriend. And that pretty much focuses on her navigating a relationship with a baby. Then that is pretty much where it ends. At that point, Teen Mum ended. The audience and the mums all thought that the show was over. Little did they know that it was actually just a bit of a hiatus. And as this phase of Teen Mum came to an end, Farrah released an album and memoir combo titled my teenage dream ended. And I'm firstly just going to start off talking about the book, which reached number 11 on the New York Times bestseller list. And honestly, there's not too much to say about the book other than the fact that even though it reached the New York Times bestseller list, it was not met with very good reviews. One of the most common critiques that I saw was that it was filled with many grammatical errors. And um, as a standalone product, I really cannot recommend it. There's a lot of kind of unnecessary details here and there and the exposition's all kind of sloppy and messed up and not to mention there's like commas where there shouldn't be. And yeah, some of the chapters in this book coincide with some of the tracks on the album released with it. And to say the least, this album was met with far worse reviews than the book. The sound of the album was kind of described as techno dance pop with auto-tune. It was definitely giving Rebecca Black Friday, but everything that made that song bad was amped up. It was kind of camp, if you will. But yeah, it was released with the leading singles Getting Up from Rock Bottom and On My Own. And much like Rebecca Black's Friday, they were mass disliked on YouTube and received really bad reviews. But despite the initial dislike for this album, it actually seems like this album has aged well. While I was researching her music, it seems like that it has gained a cult following. If you look at the comments on her music these days, the majority of them are all positive. At first I assumed it was some kind of joke, and I do think that a lot of people were joking, but it does seem like some people genuinely seem to like this album. I think part of it is people looking back and wondering how how something like this was even made into existence to begin with and kind of just appreciating it for the sheer fact that something as insane as this album was created. Kind of how I expect people to look back on Riverdale in a few years and kind of just going along for the ride instead of cringing at how bad it is. But also from what I was able to find, it seems like the change in opinion towards Farrah's album was helped along by an article written by The Fader in 2017. It was titled, Farrah Abraham's pop music should make her an avant-garde icon. That article helped shed some light on how the album was made. According to an interview in this article with the producer of Farrah's album, Farrah didn't want to listen to the music as she sang the song. Usually I plug someone into the studio and let them record over the music, but she didn't want to do that. She was just hesitant to sing it. I didn't know what to do, but as an engineer, we problem solve. The only thing I could think of was, okay, I'm going to give you no music, but I'll give you a click track, which is like a metronome, something to keep her on time. And here are some snippets of her songs. Let me know if you think she stayed on time. So yeah, it's not only the unique and disturbing sound of the album that made it stand out, it's also got a very unique story in terms of how it was produced. And this is why a select group of people consider it an avant-garde masterpiece. So now I want to talk about some of Farrah's most controversial parenting moments. And because Farrah was such a controversial figure on Teen Mum, her parenting was something that was always watched like a hawk by the tabloids and was something that was always brought up in interviews. And I'm just going to say that I don't know the first thing about parenting at all. And honestly, I'm sure if I was a parent, I would suck. So I'm not here to judge her by any means, but I'm just going to go over the things that were considered the most controversial. One thing that has consistently been brought up over the years is how Farrah said in an interview that she was taking a break from four-year-old Sophia. A quote from the article is, she has her own life and is doing her own thing and I'm doing mine. You know how the babies of wild animals are just able to fend for themselves right from the get-go? If you follow me on Instagram, you'll probably know that I have guinea pigs and from time to time those guinea pigs have babies and those babies just, as soon as they fly out of the womb, they're like out in the world 
eating solid foods. And based on Farrah's behavior, it kind of seems that that's what she expected having a baby would be like. They could just have their own separate lives doing their own things. Another time when Farrah came under fire for controversial parenting was when she tried to wax and then pluck her three-year-old daughter's unibrow. Farrah made a post on her blog detailing how the situation all went down. So I'll read out an excerpt from that for y'all and just know that I'm going to be putting the exact quote up on the screen, typos and all, so just know that they're not my typos. So I told Sophia, my daughter who is a late three years old, of the little issue on her brow, and I showed her how I waxed mine off, so I tried to wax her. The second the dab hit her uni, she touched it with the towel she had in her hand. This is hard to read, I'm sorry. Uh, so now, wax was in the towel, and I yanked it back ASAP, but fuzz was not stuck to the wax, stuck to her uni. OMG moment. So now Sophia was freaking out. So I had to act like it was a cool science project to get the wax off. Plot to end this. Yeah. Sophia fell asleep. I got my tweezers and pluck, pluck, pluck. Soph was not saying ouch or anything and was still asleep. I got most of it off and then finally she woke up. I went to sleep. The next morning I showed her and told her how well she did and she didn't even know. She was more intrigued now to be okay with upkeeping her non-unibrow. I could tell she was proud. And immediately there was a big uproar to this. On toddlers and tiaras, there have been kids who have been waxed from ages 5 to 9, but none as young as Sophia was. So Farrah doing that to Sophia at that age was kind of unheard of. And a lot of people felt as though Farrah were projecting her own insecurities onto her daughter, because at that point Farrah had a lot of cosmetic procedures done under her. But from what I was seeing, the response on the internet actually seemed to support Farah. People had wished that their parents had done a similar thing for them. So yeah, it was a pretty polarizing subject. And then Farah addressed the criticism in an interview that she did with ABC, and this is what she had to say. People just kept commenting on a unibrow, and I was just like, maybe I am letting it go too far. So yeah, other controversial parenting moments include, but are not limited to, Farah giving Sophia $600 for losing a tooth, involving Sophia in her feud with Nicki Minaj. Hi everybody, Nicki Minaj is a total loser. And letting her wear makeup at a young age. You got into an argument with the school principal about your seven-year-old wearing makeup, is that right? Um, I was just called a couple of times um, about my daughter wearing makeup. Again, I'm not saying that there is anything particularly wrong or right with what she does as a parent, but these are just some of the most controversial moments. But something that was not only controversial for Farah as a parent, but just in general, was Farah joining the adult industry. Basically, it started when rumors were circulating that Farah had made an adult tape. At first, Farah denied ever making a tape, but then later confirmed that she hired James Dean, an adult film star, through a production company to make a personal tape. On Dr. Phil, she talked about how she never wanted the tape to be released, and it was made for her to purely admire. So I wanted just to like show more of my your side to who me you want to show you want to show this you is for me and I just feel like how I represent things for myself like this was for me to see so like so you want to watch my... you but she soon grew concerned that the production company had made copies of the tape and that James Dean would reveal more information about the tape he was actually the one who sparked the initial rumors of some kind of adult tape by the way and that is when she decided to shop around the tape in an interview she said let me be one step ahead and let me gain control of my own video again and so her dad actually helped her negotiate some kind of deal to sell the tape and she ended up selling it to vivid entertainment for 1.5 million dollars the tape was called back door teen mum and allegedly vivid had over 2 million visits to their website after the drop of the tape, which broke records for them. And to this day, Farah still claims that this was a personal tape that was leaked. But James Dean revealed that there was some kind of marketing strategy behind this film. When he was approached to make this film, he was presented with a marketing strategy. And at the time, he told them that he would not be able to follow through with it, but they still decided to film with him anyways. In the most diplomatic way, Farah had her marketing strategy Vivid had their marketing strategy. 
I explained to them that I shouldn't be in this movie because I will not be able to support either of the marketing. Well, I didn't even know Farrah's marketing strategy, but I, I'm like, oh, Vivids, I'm like, I will not be able to support your marketing strategy because they want to do this thing where they were pretending we were dating and all this stuff like that. They're like, we'll go out, we'll pay you, go out to dinner with her, and we'll, we'll call TMZ and they'll take pictures. I'm like, no, I'm absolutely not going to do that. Okay, well, don't worry about it. We're, we'll just take some pictures on set and we'll leak them. And I mean, the fact that there was a marketing strategy kind of not only suggests, but confirms that this was not just a tape for her own personal use. And not to mention, there was a sequel, Farrah 2, Backdoor, and more. And as an extension to being in the adult industry, she released an erotic novel and released a series of custom adult toys. So yeah, she definitely made the most out of being in the adult industry. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about how much of a girl boss Farrah was. If there was a Mount Rushmore for girl bosses, Farrah's face would definitely be on it because she has milked her teen mum fame for all that it's worth and I can't fault her for it. So one of her first business ventures was a collaboration with her mum and her grandmother. And that was a food and wine company called Mum and Me Foods. But based on the picture on their logo, it's hard to tell whether it's a food company or a cult. The first product that they launched was an all-purpose Italian pepper sauce. And make sure you call it the right thing, otherwise Farrah will passive-aggressively correct you. Are you still doing your spaghetti sauce? I love that you call it spaghetti sauce. It's it so was. quaint. Wait, what was the spaghetti sauce? <laughs> it's still there. But what is it called? It's not spaghetti sauce. It's all purpose sauce. It's called <laughs> Mom and Me. The then they later released a couple more sauces as well as a wine. And at a certain point that I can't pinpoint, Farrah and Sophia were actually phased off of the logo. It's never mentioned why this happened, but my guess would be that it was because Farrah is a very controversial person, and they probably thought that they would have a better chance at getting on supermarket shelves if Farrah's face wasn't on the logo. But even after she wasn't on the logo, she still endorsed the products and advertised them. But eventually, the company did just end without a word from anyone. Then Farrah opened up a frozen yogurt store in Texas called... Froco Fresh Frozen. And the process of this shop operating was documented on a season of Teen Mum. It showed Farrah berating her parents while they were trying to help her set the store up. She had some issues with staff, which really doesn't surprise me because I feel like Farrah gets into a fight with anybody she crosses paths with. Essentially what happened was that she didn't train a staff member properly, and then when that staff member didn't properly do something, she got mad at them and fired them, and the shop wasn't receiving good reviews either. Extremely rude and unprofessional. I would never eat here. If you watch Teen Mum when everyone is working in Froco, no one is wearing gloves when they cut and prepare the toppings. They are touching all the food with their bare hands. Went there on vacation with my family. Very rude staff. Manager cursed at my wife for requesting fresh strawberries. Its rating was sitting at 2.4 stars when it closed down. And Farrah had a couple of other businesses like this. She had a furniture store called Furnished by Farrah and a boutique called Sophia Laurent Child's Boutique. And both of these stores received bad reviews. And both of those stores didn't last very long either. They shut down just a couple of years after they opened. And then because of those stores, Farrah was hit with a lawsuit. She owed over $100,000 in unpaid rent. According to court documents issued by the landlord, their request for payment was received pretty coldly by Farrah. Farrah's lawyers indicated that she had no intention on making any further payments under the lease agreement. So when Farrah initially started renting at these storefronts, she signed a 60-month lease. And she started renting in 2016. So as per the lease agreement, she had to continue renting until 2021. But she abandoned her businesses and stopped paying rent in 2018. Not much came of the lawsuit in 2018, but for the landlord, it was not over. In 2021, the case was reignited and the landlord requested Farrah to pay $640,000 in rent and then an additional $30,000 in lawyer's fees, coming to a grand total of $670,000. And then, much to Farrah's dismay, the judge granted the landlord's request ordering Farrah to pay the $670,000. So yeah, her girl boss era didn't have the best end. Okay, so now it's time to bring it back to Teen Mom. In 2015, after two years hiatus, MTV rebooted the show. They renamed it Teen Mom OG, and initially Farrah wasn't invited back. 
Apparently, all of the other teen mums threatened to not return if Farrah was also invited back. And I guess the network executives decided that having three mums was better than having one. So they did not invite Farrah back. However, when the network wasn't happy with how the three storylines were panning out, they decided to call on Farrah. They invited her back and she made her first appearance in season five in episode five. And when Macy heard that Farrah was being invited back, she threatened to quit. Farrah found out that Macy did that and that added some tension between Farrah and the other teen mums when they would go do press events together. Other than that, in season five, there were a lot of ups and downs for Farrah and her boyfriend, Simon. But the biggest down of the season with Farrah was when she got into a fight with the producers. The producers and camera crew show up to her home, but she refuses to do anything with them and tells them to go home. She does this because they denied her request to appear on another reality TV show that focuses on the struggles with her mother, which they called a breach of contract. Things of course escalate and they start yelling at each other and Farrah ends up pushing their producer. And then that takes us to season six. There's lots more relationship drama between Farrah and Simon. One issue being Simon posting Deborah's mugshot Bruh. to his social media. And the drama only intensifies when she decides to move to LA and she doesn't like how he's trying to help her. Because of this and a host of other reasons, they decide to break up. And it's in this season that Farrah opens up that frozen yogurt store that I was talking about. And then by the end of season six, her and Simon have somewhat reconciled and she still has issues with her mother. And then season seven comes along and spoiler alert, this is Farrah's last season. The show doesn't get canceled or anything. It's just that Farrah gets kicked off the show. Pretty much what happens is that Farrah has another blow up with another producer and she demands that they get rid of that producer and bring in a new producer for her. MTV is not having this. And at that point, Farrah had actually decided to re-enter the adult industry by doing an X-rated webcam show. And initially, when she first was invited back to the show, she had to come to the agreement that she would not re-enter the adult industry. And she agreed to that. So that was another issue that was raised and she was ultimately kicked off the show because of it. Then a few episodes later, they bring in a couple of new mums to replace Farrah, as if she was never even there to begin with. But that's not where it ends. She ended up suing MTV's parent company, Viacom claiming that she was fired from the network for pursuing a career in the adult industry. And then this ends up getting settled outside of court. And she made this statement. I'm happy Viacom wanted to settle and I'm thrilled with the outcome. I did the right thing by filing a lawsuit. I honestly felt that if I didn't stand firm, I would have regretted it my entire life and I would have thought my entire life I should have sued. Hopefully MTV gave her enough money to pay that rent back. And obviously there mustn't have been too many hard feelings between her and MTV because they brought her back for Teen Mum Family Reunion. So yeah, that is kind of where it ends for now. And I just want to let you all know that I have made a Patreon exclusive video to accompany this video. In that video, I talk about the feud between her and Nicki Minaj, the feud between her and Charlie Sheen, and her being a Karen. So if you're interested in that, the link to sign up to my Patreon is in the description box below. Anyways, that is pretty much everything for this video. Don't forget to drink water, be nice to animals. Let's take a moment of silence for everyone who has to deal with Karens or Farrah Abraham. And I'll see you in my next video.